tremendous privilege we have this morning just to spend some time opening up the Word of God together. Um, if you're new with us this morning, first let me just say welcome. It is fantastic to have you here. It's a great thing that you came here to worship with us, and we're thankful that you came to NBC to worship this morning. Now, on most Sunday mornings, you'll see somebody standing up here who is much shorter than me, um, but who is also much smarter than me as well. And uh, Pastor John is in, in Japan this week, and he'll be back for next Sunday service. So I would just encourage you, those, those of you who are new, that you would come back again next week, and uh, I think you'll truly be blessed to sit under his teaching. Uh, I realize that Cyril had the announcement time this morning, but I, I still feel like it's, it's one of those things that I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to just share one quick announcement with you. And I, I made a commitment earlier last week uh, to do this, and so uh, I'm going to follow through on that commitment. Um, one of our faithful members had asked why it is that here we are in mid-October, and nobody has announced the fact that October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, and, I, and I told him that, you know, it would probably sound a little bit self-seeking or strange if, if Pastor Jonathan or Pastor John stood up here and said, mm, it's time to appreciate us. Uh, so, but he assured me, he said that since I'm not ordained yet as a pastor, I could get away with saying this and uh, you guys wouldn't think ill of me. So uh, I, I do make mention of the fact that October is indeed Pastor Appreciation Month and I would encourage you just to uh, just drop a note to the pastors. Just let them know how much you appreciate them. At NBC, we truly are blessed with some incredible pastors, uh, some men who are wholly focused and wholly devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and men who absolutely love this church family. And uh, it would just be a great thing if you could just drop them a quick note, and even more so than that, uh, to be lifting them up in your prayers, to remember your pastors on a daily basis when you approach the Lord in prayer. Remember your pastors. Uh, they can certainly use your prayer support. Well, I believe it was R.C. Sproul who said that the 10th chapter of Acts is possibly the most important chapter in the entire book of Acts, and possibly even the most important chapter in the entire New Testament. Now, we affirm that all Scripture is breathed by God. It, it's profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Nevertheless, we recognize that on certain subjects, some texts are able to say a little bit more than other texts are. And with the passage that we're studying this morning, it has a great deal to say on a great number of subjects. But with regard to the subject of the gospel of Christ, Acts 10 is incredibly important, particularly to those of us who were not born Jewish. And I think that's probably the overwhelming majority of us in the sanctuary this morning. For the past couple months now, Pastor John has been preaching on, on the heart of the gospel and then also on, on telling the gospel truth. Uh, and that's all under the umbrella of Christ's last will and testament in which he said to go and make disciples. Uh, that's been our area of focus for these past several weeks, and I hope to bring my message this morning under that same general umbrella. And having told you already that Acts chapter 10 is one of the most important chapters in the book of Acts, um, as you look at your ch church bulletins, you might be wondering why it is that we're covering Acts chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 18. Well, I'll do my best to explain that, but first let me go ahead and read our passage. I'm going to read these 18 verses aloud, and I would just ask that you would follow along in your Bibles. We're in Acts chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision of something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice say to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing uncommon or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, 
three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. And these six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angels stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, the reason that we're in Acts 11 this morning instead of Acts 10 is is that the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible are not inspired. While while all scripture is God-breathed, the numbers that help us find our places in those scriptures is not God-breathed. It's not inspired by God. It's an invention of man to help us out. And and the fact of the matter is that um, in both Acts 10 and 11, Uh, comprise one large narrative. It's it's 66 verses in in this one chunk of Scripture. In fact, this this is the longest narrative in the entire book of Acts. Dr. Luke spent a great amount of pen or or ink and paper on on this one event. And while I thoroughly enjoy going through all 66 of those verses, verse by verse with you, it would probably take us until Tuesday to do that, And we've got choir practice tonight, so it's just a non-starter. We can't do that. So we're just going to focus our our vision just on these 18 verses. We will get into uh, part of Acts 10 as well, uh, but primarily we're going to be focusing on these 18 verses in chapter 11. Well, I've entitled this sermon, The The Privilege of Sharing the Gospel, and it truly is a privilege to share the gospel. So if you're taking notes, you can write that across the top of your paper, and you can go, go ahead and also write down point number one of your outline. And point number one is the privilege of Peter. The privilege of Peter is point number one. How's that for an alliteration? Uh, That makes the old-timey Southern Baptist happy when you can do some alliteration like that. I'm glad I was able to work that in. Now, since we haven't been studying through the book of Acts, uh, it's it's necessary to give a little bit of context in which uh, this passage was written. Now, the book of the Acts of the Apostles was written by Dr. Luke. Uh, He's the same man who wrote the gospel according to Luke. And at the very beginning of this book of Acts, uh, we come across one of the verses that Pastor John has been bringing to our attention over these past few weeks. Uh, And it's part of that last will and testament of Jesus Christ. After his resurrection and right before his ascension, Jesus said to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's recorded there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And then the rest of the book of Acts is really how that whole process unfolds, how how they go from being in Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria until the end of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, we see the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon the Jewish believers dwelling in Jerusalem. Uh, These folks had come from all over the world, Uh, speaking different languages, but ethnically speaking, they were Jews. Uh, Although they were from different places, they didn't understand each other's tongues, they were still ethnically, by ethnicity, they were Jewish, and they they became believers and they were anointed with the Holy Spirit. Over the next several chapters, we read about how the early church came together there in Jerusalem. They they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and, and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. And they gathered together. They became unified in Christ. There was unity unity there in Jerusalem, and it was in Christ. Uh, But it's not until the 8th chapter of Acts that you see them starting to fan out from Jerusalem. Uh, In Acts 8, 1, we read that Saul approved of the execution of Stephen. And then right after that, we read, There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were scattered throughout the region of Judea. And Samaria. If you look down just a couple more verses, uh, Acts 8 4, you read that those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Does that sound familiar? So Jesus said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And because of the heavy handed persecution of of Saul and his stooges, the 
the disciples, they fled from Jerusalem out into Judea and Samaria, and they preached the word everywhere they went. In fact, in Acts chapter 8, we read that Philip was witnessing to many people in Samaria, and there was great joy in the city in which he preached the word. Uh, Later in that same chapter, we read about Philip witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, He started with Isaiah 53, and he taught him the good news about Jesus Christ. And that man, that eunuch, believed in Christ, and he was baptized. He was baptized on the side of the road, and and that road led from Jerusalem to Gaza. So it was outside of Jerusalem that that Philip was witnessing. And then in Acts chapter 9, we read about Saul's conversion. Uh, Saul became Paul in Acts 9. And that really had a calming effect upon the church, at least initially it did. In Acts 9.31, we read that the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And I, I understand that I risk beating a dead horse on this. I know Pastor John has talked about this several times and just as far as how, how God builds up his church, but I love coming across verses like this. The church was being built up. You notice that it didn't say that the the church was building itself up, right? It it didn't say that the church had figured out some really cool seeker-sensitive type programs uh, or that they developed some really fluffy and and half-baked, half-truth kind of messages. Uh, It doesn't say that the church offered uh, free falafel and free kefir to the the first hundred guests that came in, right? Right? No, it was God that was building up the church. The church wasn't building itself up. All the church was doing, they were simply walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I I just have this strong desire that that would be the reputation that NBC would have. And perhaps that's already being said about our church. As I look out over the congregation, I see many people who are already dedicated to bringing up their children in the fear of, and the admonition, and the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I also see many people who are, are suffering through different griefs, but they are being comforted by the Holy Spirit. I praise God for the, the work that he's doing in and through us here at NBC. I may continue to build us up as a church. Uh, so there in Acts 9, the church had spread out from Jerusalem throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and the believers were witnessing, and they were sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. They were obedient to the command to go make disciples and to be his witnesses. And then we come to the epic events recorded in Acts chapter 10 and 11. And as we set our focus back on our passage for this morning, uh, we're going to first look at the privilege of Peter. So in Acts 11 verse 2, we read that Peter went up to Jerusalem. He had been out witnessing throughout all Judea. Uh, he He was in Leda and he healed a man there named Aeneas. After that, he had gone to Joppa and he came across this kind lady named Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, and, and she became ill and, and she died. And then Peter brought her back to life. After that, he was in Caesarea. And that's where the focus of our attention is this morning, is the events that took place there in Caesarea. So as we read in Acts 11:2 that he went up to Jerusalem to tell the church what had happened there in Caesarea, we see that specifically he had to address the criticism of some Jewish believers who had heard that Peter had spent time with the uncircumcised, even eating with them. And one thing we need to realize is that up to this point in the very short history of this church, uh, those who were being saved, those who were converting to Christianity, were predominantly Jewish. Uh, In fact, it wasn't until later on in this chapter, in Acts chapter 11, that that people were starting to first be referred to as Christians. Uh, At these early stages in the church, there were many Jewish converts who who still held to the Mosaic and the rabbinic laws that really governed the nation. They still believed that it was forbidden for Jews to eat with Gentiles. In their eyes, people fell into one, basically one of four categories. Uh, The first category were the Gentiles, uh, who were basically your everyday, run-of-the-mill kind of pagans, like us. We would fall into that category. We're the Gentiles. And the Jews despised the Gentiles. They absolutely hated the Gentiles. In fact, they look at the Gentiles as being so unclean uh, that even the, even the dust from the soil from Gentile lands was considered unclean and defiled. And so the, the Jews had practiced, they had developed this practice of any time they had gone to uh, a foreign land, when they came back, they would wipe off the dust from their feet 
so as to not defile the Holy Land with Gentile soil. They, they looked upon the Gentiles as being unclean and they hated them. And throughout history, the Gentiles have looked at the Jews and, and returned that hatred. Uh, even today, there are quite a few people who would look at the Jews and, uh, with a large amount of hatred who, are, who have disdain for the Jewish nation. Uh, the second category of people that the Jews would uh, categorize folks with uh, was the Samaritans. The Jews considered the Samaritans as half-breeds, and they also despised them, that possibly even more than the Gentiles. And then the third category of people were the God-fearers. And these were the Gentiles who had dismissed the pantheistic teachings of their, of their homeland and instead had decided to follow the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jews, at least to the best of their abilities. And they were allowed to go into the court of the Gentiles in the temple, uh, but they couldn't go into any of those inner courts. They, they hadn't fully become Jewish proselytes. They hadn't become Jewish, uh, but they had set their faith in the Jewish God. Uh, they hadn't gone through the, the uh, practice of circumcision. They hadn't adopted the, the food laws, but they decided that they would pray to the God of the Old Testament. They were unclean still in the eyes of the Jews, but they were just mostly unclean, right? So any good God-fearing Jew would never enter the home of any of these people. And that brings us to the fourth category, the, the God-fearing Jews, the good God-fearing Jews. Peter and, his disciples, and the disciples, they all fell into this category. Uh, they believed that they were set apart from those unclean Gentiles. Uh, for millennia, Jews had been taught that they were not to mix with the people of foreign lands. Uh, and that was especially true in the intertestamental period. Uh, the rabbis had, had come up with even more laws that, that restricted any sort of um, interaction with Gentiles. Uh, just by way of example, there was one law that the rabbis came up with that said if, you, if a Jew was to drink the milk that had been extracted by the hands of a Gentile, that Jew would remain unclean for seven full days. And just a remarkable thing. If, if, you, if you think about the real Mosaic law, the law that God gave to Moses that he wrote down, in Leviticus chapter 11, uh, there's an example of, of what would make a person unclean. And so, uh, if you look in Leviticus 11, if there's an animal that dies and then a Jew decides to eat off of that carcass, uh, that Jew would need to wash his clothes and then he would remain unclean until that evening. Uh, but here in the intertestamental period, the, the rabbis were coming up with all these new regulations like you can't even drink milk that was pulled out by the hands of a Gentile. If you do, you're unclean for an entire week. And so there was this obstacle, there was this wall that was put up between Jews and Gentiles. So Peter had those obstacles. He, he was part of that fourth category. He was one of the Jews, and he believed those things that, the, that they had been taught for hundreds of years. Now, he had already witnessed to the Jews in Jerusalem and to all those in Judea, but he hadn't yet gotten to a place where he was witnessing to the end of the earth. He hadn't yet had the privilege of, of sharing the gospel message to the end of the earth. Now, look back at Acts chapter 11, verse 4 to see Peter's answer to that criticism uh, from the circumcision party. Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. And then Peter laid out that vision that he saw. He, he saw this great big sheet, uh, and it was like it was similar to the, the sail of a large ship. And inside that sheep, sheet, not sheep, inside that sheet, there might have been sheep, but there were all kinds of animals. There, there, were, there were clean animals and unclean animals as well that had been lo lowered down, and he saw those. And then he heard that voice that told him to rise up, to kill, and to eat. And then Peter said two words that, that really don't go well together at all. Uh, he said, no, Lord. No, Lord. By no means, Lord. Now, it's easy to kind of sit back and, and look at Peter and say, how on earth could you say no, Lord? But then we need to do a little bit of self-reflection, right, and see, all right, how many times have I said the same thing? No, Lord, by no means, Lord. I, I read your commandment, but I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Well, Peter's objection was that there were unclean animals in that sheet. He said, nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And it's really funny that he actually said that because he said it right after he said, no, Lord. So nothing 
unclean has entered my mouth, but what has come out, right? It reminds us of, of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 15, 11, where he said, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. And I don't know where Peter was during that teaching. He might have been absent that day, but he, he didn't get that lesson. Uh, but here we see that the voice in Peter's vision, it answered his rebuttal, and he said, what God has made clean, do not call common. And it seems like Peter needed to hear this uh, at least a couple more times uh, because he reported this happened three times and then all was drawn up back into heaven. And this certainly is in, in line with Peter's history, right? I mean, he denied Christ three times. Uh, Christ asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And here we see him having the same vision three times. If you're following in the text there, you'll see in Acts 11, 11, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. And then Peter must have either nodded or, or pointed over to some guys that were next to him. And he said, these six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. At this point, I just want to turn our focus away from Peter for a couple minutes, and we're going to look at the man whom he went to visit there in Caesarea. Uh, Turn with me just one chapter back to Acts chapter 10, and we're going to look at the conversion of Cornelius. And that's the second point in our outline, is the the conversion of Cornelius. Acts 10.1 tells us that there was a Roman soldier uh, who was, he went by the name of Cornelius. That was a really common name during that time. And he was stationed in Caesarea. Now, Caesarea was a town that had really been built up by uh, Herod the Great. Uh, a great amount of money, a large sum of money was invested into that town. They made a man-made harbor there, and Caesarea became the capital of the Roman occupation there in Palestine. Now, Cornelius was a centurion, and that meant that he was in charge of at least 100 soldiers. And he was part of this unit that was called the Italian Cohort. That sounds like a really cool name, the Italian Cohort. Um, and... Some scholars would say that they were probably along the lines of the special forces or special operating forces of the the, uh, Italian army, and uh, maybe likened to the Green Berets or the Navy SEALs or something along those lines. Well, in verse 2 there, we're, we're told that he was a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. So Cornelius would have been placed most likely into that third category that we talked about. He was, he was one of those God-fearers. Uh, he, now, he hadn't taken that extra step of becoming circumcised, uh, but he put his faith in God, at least to the best of his ability. Now, it's one thing to become circumcised when you're eight days old. Uh, it's a completely different subject when you're 28 years old, right? And so I don't know how old Cornelius was, but that wasn't a step that he was willing to take. He, he was fine with with being on the outside in the court of the Gentiles. Uh, One thing that we need to note also is that Cornelius was not saved at this point. Uh, How can this be? It says that he was a a devout man who feared God. Uh, He gave money to the people. He even prayed continually to God. But he wasn't saved. John 14, 6, Jesus says himself, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Cornelius was a religious man, and he he had a a limited knowledge of God, but he wasn't saved. We also know this is true because of what we've already read in Acts chapter 11 and verse 13. Uh, There again, Peter was retelling the message that the angel had told to Cornelius, and the angel said, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter, and he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved you and all your household, a message by which you will be saved, future tense. Cornelius was not saved. And we'll take a look at the implications of that here in just a couple minutes. Um, But that's just something I want to highlight at this point. Look there at verse 3 of chapter 10. It says, about the ninth hour of the day, and, and this was usually a time that was set apart for praying, the ninth hour of the day, he, being Cornelius, saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, 
whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So in the next several verses there, Luke records the vision that Peter had, which we had already looked, about, looked at in chapter 11. He also records the meeting that took place between those men that Cornelius sent down to Joppa and Peter. Look real quickly down to verse 23, where it says that he, this is speaking of Peter, invited them in to be his guests. Peter invited these three Gentiles, including a Roman soldier, into the house to be his guest. This was really a remarkable thing. This was, simply wasn't something that was done by the Jews. So we can tell already at this point, God had been working in Peter's heart and starting to break down that barrier that, that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. If he was willing to invite those three guests into his home, these Gentiles from, from another nation, uh, it's showing some sort of growth in Peter. And then look at verse 28 now. This is Peter speaking again, and this time he's in Caesarea, and he's speaking to Cornelius and his relatives and to his close friends. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. This truly, truly is an incredible thing. And it's easy to read this and really not catch the significance of what just happened there. For hundreds and upon hundreds of years, the Jews had been taught over and over again, Gentiles are unclean. Keep them away. You are set apart from them. But God did away with that. In this one act, in this vision that he gave to Peter, he broke down the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. And from this point forward, the church would never be the same again. In fact, the world would never be the same again. From this point on. Now let's look back to the original text that we're looking at in Acts chapter 11. And I want you to look back down at verse 15 again. Acts 11, 15. This is Peter still speaking to those Jewish believers who had criticized him for eating with the uncircumcised men. And he was explaining how he shared the gospel message with Cornelius and his household. And he said, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Isn't that incredible? I mean, aren't, aren't you glad that God did this? I mean, I mean as a bunch of heathen Gentiles, uh, we, we should all be really, really glad that God extended that grace to even to the Gentile people. We should be extremely glad about that. So this far, thus far, we've looked at the privilege that Peter was given to share the gospel with the Gentiles. Uh, we've also seen the conversion there of Cornelius. Uh, now let's look at the third point in our outline, which is the important implications The important implications. There truly are a large number of implications in this text. Uh, In fact, I was really kind of wondering, am I trying to take take off too large of a chunk here, 66 verses? Uh, There are a huge amount of implications in here, but we're just going to focus on a couple of them uh, here this morning. Uh, First, we need to recognize that there are soteriological implications, uh, and and that's just kind of a fancy way of saying that uh, we have a better understanding of salvation Uh, the study of salvation as a result of what we see here in Acts 10 and 11. We understand how man is saved because of what is written here. Uh, First, we should make note of the fact that it is possible to be a really good person uh, without being saved. Uh, In reality, there are none who are really good, right? Uh, When we're comparing ourselves to a holy God, nobody stands up to that measure of being really good. But in the world's eyes, it's, it's, it's possible to be really good to donate all kinds of money to the poor, uh, to be somebody who has a reputation for praying to God all the time. It's it's, it's possible to be really good, in the world's eyes at least, without being saved. Uh, That was Cornelius. He was a good guy. He gave to the poor. He prayed continually. He, He was a real religious man. But being good, being religious, isn't what brings about salvation. It's the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, next, we need to see that, that the sovereignty of God 
is in full display in the salvation there. Uh, from, from the beginning of time, God chose Cornelius to be saved. Uh, there were at least 100 Roman soldiers that were there in Caesarea, probably quite a few more, but God chose Cornelius to be the one through whom the, the, that door to the Gentiles was going to be opened up. It, God chose from, from even before time began that Cornelius was going to be saved. As we go through that lengthy 66-verse passage and study the actions of Peter and, and we talk about the vision that Peter saw and, and we talk about the message that the angel delivered to Cornelius, uh, we might lose sight of the fact that Cornelius was a real man. Uh, th- these events really did happen. Cornelius was a, a, a man in the flesh, just like us. Um, now, I won't say that he put his pants on one leg at a time like we do. I, I mean, he probably wore one of those Roman soldier miniskirts and stuff like that. But, but he, was, he was a real man, just like, like we are. And God saved him. God chose to save this man. He initiated the work in Cornelius' salvation. The same could be said of any of us who are born again. Uh, there's not one of us who came to the point of salvation because of anything that we did. Uh, we, we never got smart enough to finally figure things out so that we could be saved. Uh, we never got cleaned up enough to get good in God's eyes. Uh, we didn't stop sinning long enough for, for God to finally be able to pat us on the back and say, well done, I'm going to give you repentance that leads to life. No, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We also need to understand that there are evangelistic implications from this text. Uh, Just as God predestined and prepared Cornelius for salvation, God also prepared Peter to deliver that message unto Cornelius for his salvation. And and this is really a remarkable point. Uh, Did you catch when we were talking about um, that the angel giving that message to Cornelius, that God didn't use the angel to share the gospel message with Cornelius. God said, go fetch Peter. Now, if you're taking a look at this, uh, maybe from a business perspective, wouldn't it be a lot more efficient if, if the angel just shared the gospel message? I mean, th- this was an angel of God that was sent to Cornelius to talk to him. Why not just have the angel share the message? I mean, it took four days for for Cornelius to send those guys and uh, to fetch Peter and for Peter to come back to Caesarea from Joppa four days later. I mean, wouldn't it have just been faster just to say, hey, angel, tell them the good news about Jesus? Uh, but that's not God's ways. I mean, in our human wisdom, we might say, hey, this might be a better way of doing things, God, and maybe in some human pride as well. But uh, praise God that that is not his plan. That is not, how the way, uh, that is not the way that he brings about salvation. Uh, There are several passages in the New Testament that speak directly to the subject. Let's quickly just take a look at two of them. Uh, First, turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 6. Now, the the letter to the church in Ephesus uh, is really a fantastic letter. And anytime you're trying to quote from the book of Ephesians, it's difficult to find a a starting place and a stopping place. It's all just so good. But we're going to look, starting at verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 3, and then we're going to look down through verse 10. So Ephesians 6 verse, uh, or Ephesians 3, excuse me, verses 6 through 10. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. There's a lot to unpack just uh, from that one verse alone, but here we can see that Peter, or Paul is teaching that the Gentiles are our fellow heirs with the Jews. And again, this was a subject that needed quite a bit of teaching. If you look through the New Testament, this is a subject upon which the writers spent quite a bit of time breaking down that preconceived notion that Jews and Gentiles are separate, uh, that, that that wall had been taken down. Look there at verse 7. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone that is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. 
Did you catch that? Paul, Paul first, he recognized the fact that it was a gift of God. He was given a privilege to preach the gospel message to the Gentiles. And then in verse 10, he said that it was through the church that the manifold wisdom of God would be shared. It would be made known. This is God's plan for redemption. This is God's plan for spreading the redemption message. That he would entrust the message of salvation to the likes of you and to the likes of me is just a remarkable thought. The trust that the Lord puts in us to share that word. The second passage that I want to look at is in the 10th chapter of Paul's letter to Romans, to the Romans. Romans chapter 10, Paul had just mentioned that there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Again, he's needing to hammer home this point. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, between Jew and Gentile. And then in verse 13, he wrote, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Uh, These are all rhetorical questions, and the implied answer for all of those is they can't. Uh, They can't call on him in whom they've never believed. Uh, They can't believe in whom of whom they've never heard. Uh, They can't hear without someone preaching. Uh, They can't preach unless they are sent. And brothers and sisters, I want you to see this, that we have the privilege of being able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It is a privilege that we have been given to go and make disciples. It wasn't God's plan to leave the evangelizing to, uh, to the angels or even to the professionals, to the few professionals in the pulpits, but it was for the church. It's through the church that God's wisdom is to be made known. As we wrap up this series next week, it's my hope that each and every one of us will be obedient to the call to make disciples and to be his witnesses and that we would put our faith in God to do the work and to call the lost. I want to take just a second to, I guess, kind of get personal as far as the implications and the applications of the truth that we've covered already. Um, So as we consider these Uh, as we consider that wall being broken down between Jew and Gentile, let me just ask this. Uh, Do you have Gentiles, spiritual Gentiles, in your own life? Uh, Are there people who live differently from you outside of your comfort circle uh, who you look at as unclean or or common? Would, Would you hesitate if God told you, go and witness to these would your response be, by no means, Lord? I, I don't talk to the unclean and the, and the common. Do you have spiritual Gentiles in your own life? Uh, certainly this is something that we should take a look at in our own lives to see if, if there are walls that we need to break down, if there are barriers to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the loss that we have put up ourselves. Perhaps we need to take down those walls. I'd like to close just by calling your attention back to the passage uh, from which Pastor John had preached last Sunday, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. We looked at this passage, and particularly at, at verse 21, as we considered the work that Jesus Christ has done for us. Uh, and he who knew no sin was made to be sin for our sake. But I, see, I want you to see, even from that same passage, that the privilege we've been given, uh, that we have this privilege to witness for Christ, Look at verse 18. Again, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see the work for which we've been created there? Uh, God has entrusted us with the message of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ. Uh, God is making his appeal through us.
And our cry to the lost on behalf of Christ is, be reconciled to God. And so as we consider this, this overarching uh, subject of making disciples, as we consider Christ's call, his last will and testament to make disciples and to be his witnesses, may we be faithful and obedient to that call. <laughs>